My name is Steve Seltzer. I'm with. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the CWA Media Workers Union and rank and file member. And also, I do work week radio on KPFA. And uh, we're, we're hiring this uh, labor, video labor video project, and uh, we cover labor struggles here and around the world. And the action that we're having today, the uh, solidarity event today, is around uniting working people around the world. That the struggle of uh, the people in Chile, the struggle of the people around the world, is a struggle here in, in the Bay Area. And right now, uh, there's a massive rebellion in Chile of the working people of the entire population, 20%, 20% rally in Santiago of the entire population. So people in rebellion in Ecuador and Lebanon, all over the world for the same issues. And we're having this rally in Oakland today on November 2nd because right here in Oakland, uh, there are attacks on working people. The, the teachers and the, the parents and the students are fighting against charters, privatization, uh, and uh, the parents were beaten up at the school board meeting here in Oakland. So this is what the police are doing. They're beating up the, the parents. I mean, it's unbelievable. The parents are being beaten here uh, for protesting the closure of their public school and the establishment of more charter schools, privately owned. And the other uh, critical issue here in Oakland is Oakland is the center of uh, the port of Oakland, which has uh, the ILWU, Local 10, uh, Local 34. And these, this union was uh, an international union. Uh, it has members in Panama and in Canada. And, and in 1974, it uh, boycotted the cargo from Chile, from a military ship. So that's internationalism. And we need more of that uh, around the world, because that is the way to fight these billionaires and these dictatorships who are imposing their economic agenda on the poor and the working people around the world. And unfortunately, uh, the billionaires have a plan for Oakland, and it's not for the working people. Their plan is to build more million dollar condos. Uh, and more gentrification. And in, um, they want to take the Port of Oakland, privatize the terminal there, and build a stadium, uh, and also to uh, have um, uh, 3,000 condos, million dollar condos. Now, we're having the park today in Oakland, the Lostwood Park, and what do we see around us? We see kids of, of poor people, working people, who have full-time jobs, many of them, and can't afford housing. And what is happening is that the, in the light of this uh, dire economic situation, uh, Nancy Skinner and uh, Rob Bonta, two Democratic politicians, passed a bill to uh, impose a tax uh, to b help build the infrastructure for the stadium. And you have to ask, why are we passing taxes uh, for a billionaire, the owner of the A's is John Fisher, who also owns the Gap Corporation, who also controls the Kip Charter chain and the rocket ship chain. Why are we passing a tax to help him build a stadium infrastructure? He promised he would do it on his own, and he wants us, the people, to pay taxes to pay for his stadium. We need public housing for the homeless, for people here in Kansas. We don't need uh, more stadiums and, and more, uh, uh, basically, uh, gentrification in Oakland, San Francisco. Working people are told they have no future. So, uh, we're, this is a start. We're going to continue this united front. We need a united front of all working people around the world. In this country, we need all unions to come together and all working people. That's how we can defeat them uh, their, their policies. So this is the beginning of building that united front. And our first speaker is going to be Clarence Thomas, who is uh, formerly the Secretary Treasurer of the ILW Local 10, and also an internationalist. He's helped build the Million Worker March in Washington uh, to fight against the attacks on working people. So welcome, Clarence Thomas. Thank you, Steve. I want to welcome everyone for coming out today. There's many, many things that you could have done on this beautiful day. It is no accident that we are here with Oakland residents who are houseless. We're here at Mosswood Park. I'm a third generation longshore worker. My grandfather started working on the waterfront in 1944. Ah, like this. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. We are here today because it's time to unite our struggles. We have a wonderful delegation here from Chile. It's important for everyone to 
understand that not only is the ILWU, and in particular Local 10, concerned with the core needs and desires of our rank and file. All politics are local. We also have a history of supporting issues that are important to the entire working class and to oppress people all over the world. It started in 1935 when the fascist regime of Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. We were loading nickel and other metals destined for fascist Italy. There was a community blockade that was presented in front of the docks and longshore workers did not work that cargo. A few years later, we were loading scrap iron destined to Japan. A community picket line once again presented itself at the docks. We did not load that cargo. I'm gonna fast forward to 1973. In the aftermath of the assassination and the coup, the democratic elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende, ILWU Local 10 passed a resolution causing, calling for the refusal to handle cargo for Chile. Five years later, the headline of the San Francisco Chronicle, that's the bourgeoisie's major newspaper in San Francisco for those who don't know. The Chronicle headline read, quote, ILWU halts bombs to Chile. Large cargo of bomb parts, 22,000 pounds of destructive power were found at Pier 32 in San Francisco. And longshore workers did not handle that cargo. Yeah. But it did not end there. The longshoremen who found that cargo, spotted it, called his business agent. A brother by the name of Herbert Mills, who holds a PhD, graduated from the University of California. He was one of our leading intellectuals in Local 10. After that phone call was made, it did not end there. The union subsequently contacted U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy. We're not loading this. Kennedy subsequently got in touch with President Carter, raised the question, why is 22,000 pounds of bombs going to the most repressive regime in the world? Solidarity is not an empty slogan. Solidarity means taking action. I'm gonna point out two other things that many of you may be familiar with and may not be. I'm gonna have Jack Heyman to come up to talk a little bit about more of this after Brother Derek Muhammad speaks. The question of the anti-apartheid struggle where longshoremen refused to handle cargo from South Africa for 11 days in 1984. The people who spearheaded that action, Leo Robinson, Howard Keeler, who's the longest surviving ILW Local 10 member, I believe he's 93 years old, is that right, Jack? They were faced with heavy fines for their resolute action in stopping that cargo. When you stop international cargo, let me tell you what you do. You disrupt the supply chain. That's the engine of capitalism. And the longshore workers are critical to that engine. 
when we did not handle cargo on the Zim Piraeus in 2014 on Block the Boat, the Zim line doesn't even come back. That means that longshore workers have given up money. But we've done that as our contribution to the solidarity of the people of Palestine. That's what we call social justice unionism. At this point, I want to say one quick thing about, you see this wonderful poster here, this banner, jobs and housing for all, not another stadium support ILW workers, Answer Coalition is responsible for this. Long time coalition partners of ours. Let's give them a big hand. We're here with open residents who are houseless, but yet city council members, the Port of Oakland, State Senator Nancy Skinner, Assemblyman Rob Bonta are doing the bidding of a multi-billionaire by the name of John Fisher, a known privatizer who has taken hundreds of millions of dollars away from public education to support charter schools. He's attempting to build a 34,000 seat baseball stadium, 3,000 multi-million dollar condominiums, a 400-room hotel, 1.2 million square feet of retail space at the third busiest port on the West Coast. The Port of Oakland is the Pacific gateway to Asia. All of the almond growers, the, the growers of soybeans, the people who sell wines, grapes, all depend on the Port of Oakland. But yet, the Port of Oakland is allowing a billionaire, one of the largest landowners in the United States of America, to build at the Port of Oakland. Does that make any sense, no. brothers and sisters and comrades? No. And we're here to say that this is wrong, it's morally wrong, and it shows you the corruption the same kind of corruption that our brothers and sisters and comrades are experiencing in Chile. My wife is not here, but she's always giving me the sign to wrap it up, because we got other speakers. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to turn the mic over to Brother Derek Muhammad. He is the past secretary treasurer of ILWU Local 10. He is the founder and organizer of Longshoremen for West Oakland, one of the endorsers of this event. Brother Derek Muhammad. I want to say good morning. I want to say thank you, uh, brothers and sisters, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I want to be real brief, because I think the picture of this tent city that's right behind us speaks thousands of words, brothers and sisters. And this morning, I'm charging the, the mayor of Oakland, the city council of Oakland, and the supervisors of Alameda County with the indifference and the neglect that is absolutely unequivocally criminal, brothers and sisters. Nowhere in a civilized society should we see this. Nowhere in a civilized society should we be looking at this. And this has to do with the inordinate lust to serve the needs of the developer at the expense of the poor and marginalized people of this city. I'm a member of Local 10 uh, and have been for the past 15, going on 16 years, and currently we are in the fight of our lives. As you already know, billionaire owner of the Oakland Athletics is desirous of building a luxury condominium project down in Howard Terminal. And I say condominium project because that's what it is first, and a ball stadium project second. That project will further exacerbate the issues that the black community is experiencing, and quite frankly, all poor communities is experiencing as it relates to gentrification. 
More tent cities is what we have to look forward to. This project will also undermine port activities, shipping industry activities, which will further destabilize poor and marginalized communities and West Oakland in specific. And so I'm asking for your continued support. I'd like to link up with you. I'm meeting most of you for the first time, but I'd like to link up with you and continue our mobilization and our struggle to defeat the project that the Oakland A's have in mind. Is that all right? So I don't have much more brothers and sisters, but I'm happy to be here and I look forward to working with you all. Brother Clay. Yes, thank you, brother. Thank Brother Steve, too. Where are you, brother? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The next speaker is a sister and comrade of ours. She is a translator, linguist by profession, a mother, she's born in Chile, longtime activist, Elizabeth Milo, otherwise known as Lisa. Let's hear it from Lisa. And she's going to bring us a message from the Chilean leader of the Port Workers. Thank you very much. Here on the phone we have Carmen Mayorga, who is the president of the Port Workers, um, uh, of Maritime Workers of Chile. And uh, she's going to be giving a message of solidarity. And I'm going to be attempting to translate <laughs> um, this. One moment, please. Hey, Carmen, ¿me puedes escuchar? Ok, déjame ver. Vamos a probar bien así para asegurarnos de que te podemos escuchar bien. Habla otra vez, por favor. Sí, te escucho. Habla fuerte para que se pueda escuchar porque te tengo conectado a mi, con mi celular. Y, um, ok, ¿pueden escuchar o no? Ponlo no, abajo. Ah, abajo. Ah, abajo. Aquí. Eso. Ya, hable otra vez, por favor, para probar otra vez. Probando, probando, hazlo de nuevo. Te escuchamos. Ya te escuchamos, gracias. Dime, habla. Ya. ya. Hola Carmen. Aquí estamos frente, aquí estamos nosotros aquí en Oakland, en la, eh, junto con eh, una movilización de los activadores y de la comunidad de Oakland. Y estamos presentes con los diferentes dirigentes sindicales de los activadores del de Oakland del Oeste, luchando en contra de la privatización. Uh, aquí en Oakland y aquí también tenemos una cantidad de chilenos que estamos aquí en solidaridad y ansioso por escuchar tus palabras también sobre el movimiento que se está librando en Chile y la, las palabras de solidaridad que nos puedan brindar aquí al pueblo de los activadores y el pueblo de Oakland. Gracias. Yo lo único que digo a mis compañeros portuarios o estibadores los estibadores en el mundo somos uno solo, somos una familia What, what I want to say to my comrades and my brothers and sisters who are the uh, longshoremen uh, and dock workers that we are all one family all around the world. We are one. Woo. 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 Valparaiso together with the municipality of Valparaiso to, to be able to fight so that uh, all the ports of Chile become pub, uh, be, uh, again become Chilean ports um, and uh, to, we don't want any more privatized ports at all we want the ports to be public and in the hands of the Chilean people <laughs> sufrimos la privatización, la privatización aquí con el gobierno militar y, y los otros gobiernos que han venido pero que ellos cuenten siempre con nuestro apoyo So I would just want to say that we've all suffered here from the privatization 
uh, that was brought upon by the military dictatorship and also by the different governments that came about afterwards as well. But we are stand united in struggle together to fight that. Continue with. And so we also belong to the, organi the International Organization of Workers, and so we're going to be uh, also requesting support from them on, on your behalf as well. Uh, a letter. We're going to be su requesting support via a letter on, on, on your behalf as well. Continue. And I... so we'd like to say I'd like to say uh, greetings and warm greetings and we continue in the struggle. Se lo agradecemos muchísimo. Quieren contar un poco sobre lo que ha, lo que ha pasado en Chile eh, últimamente en estos últimos 24 horas así rápidamente si puedes. Ha votado en los cabildos abiertos, en la asamblea constituyente, en la plaza y hemos estado trabajando a la par con la municipalidad. And so we've been uh, eh, organizing at the at the cambio, we want... una constitución nueva. So we've been los, we've, los we've... Los We've been organizing um, in, in popular assemblies, in uh, open uh, assemblies throughout the entire country, in particular in Valparaiso. We've been, we have been working directly with the municipality of Valparaiso regarding this. We want major changes. We want a, we want a new constitution. Uh, we want a, a, a constitutional assembly, and, and we're fighting for that. Yeah. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias. That was a very important message, international solidarity. That's why we're here today. We can no longer afford to each have our own separate issues. We are all interconnected. Okay, the next speaker is someone who I've known for over 50 years. Yeah, I'm telling my age. But I'm telling you my age for a reason. Because the next speaker is someone who was a veteran of the 1968 student strike at San Francisco State. He is an attorney here in the city of Oakland. He's a member of the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. He's chairman of the George, John George Democratic Club. This is the progressive wing, okay? These are not the mainstream Democrats. All right. He's also representing Brother Wilson Riles, who is a former city council member of the city of Oakland. He's an elder. He's a statesman in this city who has given a number of years to the community. And he was brutalized by the Oakland Police Department while visiting the zoning office of the city of Oakland. This is the thing that Libby Shaft is doing. Having, uh, having statesmen and elders of the black community being attacked because they have arguments with city policy. Walter Riley yeah. is our next speaker. Yeah. He is also the, the father of Raymond Boots Riley, and I'm only mentioning that for one reason. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah. In this land, I can't stand to sit without getting shit thrown in my face. My brother never gets his props. I'm doing belly flops at the Department of Waste. That's from that young man, Boots Riley. <laughs> uh, the interconnectedness of all of our struggles. Uh, thankful for being here and giving me this opportunity. I talked with Pia Lavoisier uh, yesterday, and he's on his way to Cuba, and he can't be here. Um, but Pia Lavoisier is a leading figure in the U.S. in the uh, struggle for the democratic uh, movement, grassroots movement in Haiti. 
And it's interesting that we need to understand the connections between all of these things, from these encampments, from the police murder in the streets, from the uh, uh, housing campaigns all across this country, to the jobs that we need to maintain at the port uh, in Oakland, uh, in Chile, uh, what's happening in Puerto Rico. Um, some folks saying that trying to depopulate Puerto Rico of the Puerto Ricans and make it a place for a different group of people that may be happening in many other places. We think that's not possible, but look at this land here, the Ohlone land. Uh, it has happened, it is still happening. Um, it's happening in Brazil. Um, we find that there's a connection between what's happening in Chile and Brazil with the attack on indigenous people. What happened in uh, the uh, zoning department in Oakland is not separate from what's happening in Chile and what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in, in uh, Native American people, uh, indigenous folks in various parts of the world. I'll get to that in a moment, but I want to say a little bit about Haiti. Right now, millions of people are in the streets in Haiti. And all of those of the people who are here know about it, but we need you to make it, to use your megaphones to announce this to the world in a larger number. Because it's not in the headlines. 20, 25 people take an intersection in, in Venezuela and close-up cameras make it look like, you know, uh, the city uh, of, uh, uh, city is in rebellion. And millions of people take the streets in Haiti and you don't hear about it. Uh, just a short time ago, women, only women in Haiti marched in such humongous numbers that you could not see the end of it. Of the, of the line, and they covered the street, tight formation. Women, and the women's movement in the U.S. is not able to recognize that uh, because we don't raise it well enough, I guess. We'll have to say something about you know our approach. But we need to also, in our groups and in our numbers, raise up the struggle in Haiti. Because the people there are now, as they are in Chile, calling for a new constitution. They're saying that there has to be a new assembly. There has to be a new government uh, developed by the people. And that would be the new assemblies. Right now, the likelihood of pushing out this president is very strong in Haiti. Uh, and we're hoping that as we all understand how we unite with revolutionaries, how we unite with progressives, how we unite with leftist political ideology in the world, we also figure out what that is in Haiti. As it is in Chile, there are many people who have been in many movements for many, many years, decades, and they represent many trends. There are people who represent the uh, trends of the aristocracy, and they will call themselves revolutionaries. And there are people who will represent the movements of the people that are real revolutionaries, that have some sense of solidarity with the mass movement. We have to understand that's true in Haiti. So that as the folks in Haiti are rebelling against U.S. controlled government puppets for the purpose of profit, we need to understand how we know with them. Uh, in 2018, in an area of Haiti that the uh, ILWU has supported in the past, which is a port, a port city, a part of the port of Haiti, the seat and scene of rebellion for Haiti for the several hundred years, there was a massacre directed by the government. Officers in, in uniform and with U.S. weapons, weapons that can only be bought in the U.S. because there's an embargo on weapons in Haiti. They went after those people who live in that port area, in the warehouse area, and slaughtered them in large numbers. Um, they burned people in their homes. Uh, I was there and with uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters last spring, and we heard people tell us about watching a rapes. woman testify that she was raped in front of her husband and child by several of the men. And when they finished, they took her husband and child out in the streets and chopped them up and fed them to pigs. Uh, 
and she walks up. And these are not isolated stories, these are happening. This is the kind of tactics that U.S. trained mercenaries have carried out in other parts of the world. And if we are paying attention to what happens in South America, we know that this is a tactic of the intimidation, the struggle, and terror. So the terror that's being perpetrated in Haiti right now is being paid for by our dollars. Not unlike what's happening in other parts of the world, but being directly paid for. Because at this point, the money that keeps this government in power and that keeps the police running, that provides them with the uh, munitions to, to, to destroy people, is actual taxpayers' money in violation of all U.S. governments and agreements. Our money is not supposed to be spent for human rights violators. And that's part of the thing that we have to try to push back and try to win support for. That's Haiti. We could talk about Haiti forever. We could talk about any of the struggles we're engaged in forever and talk about the details and understand the anger and anguish and pain that we all feel when we, when we see our brothers and sisters suffer from the might of some power that designed on for control and, and profit. That's who we deal with. Because when we talk about people, we're all part of the same struggle. We're all part of maintaining our self, our dignity, and our ability to raise our children and look to the future generations that they can live in a world where there's peace, where there's a chance for survival, where there's a chance for living in an atmosphere of clean air and clean water. That's the struggle in Chile, that's the struggle in Brazil, that's the struggle in Haiti, and it is the struggle right here in, in, in the U.S., the same struggle. What happened with Wilson Riles? Wilson Riles and his wife, uh, Patricia St. Ange, uh, operate a, a piece of land over in uh, East Oakland, and they have on that land uh, facilities for people having communal meetings. They have a yurt. They also do uh, um, um, Prep lodges. <laughs> sweat lodges. Sweat lodges. Sweat lodges. <laughs> Thank you. Sweat lodges. Sweat lodges has all for a long been part of the struggle of indigenous people. Sweat lodges have become part of the struggle of black people in this country uh, as a way of healing, as a way of developing some sense of unity and continuity with the land that we live on and the earth that we share with uh, the animals um, and other creatures. Um, Sweat Lodges is a way of us developing unity among ourselves. Uh, a number of groups that have been organizing have used Sweat Lodges. Sweat Lodges are also protected by U.S. law and by international law. But Sweat Lodges can be attacked in many parts of the world. In the U.S., Native Americans did not have the right to practice their religion until 1978. And uh, they were jailed killed uh, and, and, and communities destroyed when people try to protect their religion. The sweat lodge that Pat St. Ange and Wilson operate um, are part of the protective religious practices in this country. I got to move fast. Mm -hmm. Wilson Wiles was, a, was, was arrested by, for going to the zoning department and saying, you can't stop us. We've already been approved. And because he was at a zoning department uh, proclaiming his rights, and because he is a black man, people in the zoning department office pushed a panic button. They have an actual panic button. And that panic button is pushed because this black man is there stating that he knows his rights and that he wants to be heard and talk to the supervisor. And they called the police to say, there's a man in here threatening us. And why is he threatening to them? Because he's a black man standing in front of him, looking like this and saying something. And that threatens certain people. And we can't allow that to exist. We can't allow that to exist among our comrades. We can't allow it to exist among the people we live in community with and our residents. And we can't allow it to exist in the people we are using. We're paying a, a tax money to maintain. The police came. And I, I saw a video. I looked at the video. He was sitting down talking in a calm manner. And when he got up to leave, the police said, stop. And he says, what for? And I don't have to. And I don't have to comply. We have a right to insist on our rights. We must always do that. Otherwise, we don't have any rights. They didn't like that and said, cuff him. 
took him down, hard to the ground. You've seen it on TV, you've seen it on video, you saw it with Oscar Grant. Took him to the ground, arm behind his back, and fell on him to handcuff him. And that's just not acceptable. That kind of tech technique, that kind of police misconduct is unacceptable. So if you ever have a chance to talk to anybody that might ever be on a jury, tell them don't accept that when you see it happening. And he's arrested for resisting the police and obstructing police officers. And we are fighting that case. He's, he, they're not charging him criminally right now because they know that masses of people are not going to accept it. But we have to fight that in court. We want to sue. But we're also looking for people to be aware of it, pass the word on, understand how this is part of the same struggle. His complaint was that he's been denied the rights that are guaranteed, supposedly guaranteed of indigenous people's spiritual practice. That's the struggle that you were in, that's the struggle we're in, and don't lose that struggle. The other thing is that the police department takes him down hard the way they take down 20-year-olds every day, right now in this city, in San Francisco. Come up to you and whether you're in the right to be where you are or whether you are wrong for being where you are, that is an illegal practice. That's acceptance, excessive force. Taking them down hard because they can, because they saw it on TV, because they like doing it. You end up smashed against the wall with your head bleeding. They, you know, they look at television and movies and see that. They take them to the hard ground and do the same thing. So not just what happened is wrong for Wilson Riles and wrong for a black person who goes to complain, particularly wrong because at these counters across this country, whether you're at a perfume counter in a department store or at a city office, if you complain and you look a certain way, you can be called violent. And you are called violent. And women know that. Black people know that. Latinos know that. You are called violent because you complain. And we can't allow that to happen. And we must rise up. And it's all about righteous anger and, and, and not become accustomed to saying this can happen. Do not allow and support any time they take somebody down hard that way. Thank you very much. One of the reasons we're having this rally here uh, is the attack on education, public education in Oakland. And we have an outrageous situation where uh, parents who were protesting the closure of a charter school uh, were attacked by the police at the Oakland School Board. I mean, you imagine that. Parents of children who are opposed to the closure of the school are beaten by the police. What did they do? They said our school shouldn't be shut down and charter school should not be set up. And we have a, a school worker today, Alma uh, DeLuke, who is going to talk about the situation in the schools and, and the struggle to have a public education. The same struggle in Chile, the same struggle in uh, Palestine, in Puerto Rico. This is an international struggle to protect publication of, uh, public education against privatization of charters. So welcome, Alma. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm a 38-year retired teacher, and I work in my local school as a volunteer. I, one thing that I'm sad about is that we don't have more young people. And I can kind of give you a hint as to why. Because education has been stripped and kids don't even recognize that they have the right to protest and to speak up for what they think is not right. And they don't, so they don't come. They don't see the connection. Uh, charter schools, everybody, including me, thought they were good. Thought, oh yeah, well, we, we, we have a place for our kids to go. But I'm here to tell you that they're not good and we should be fighting with every nerve we have to keep them from taking over the public schools. I retired from the Berkeley school system and we used to march a lot. And my sign that I always carried is that there's no democracy without education. And if we allow our students to be stripped of their right to a, a wonderful education that would take in the consideration that they have a right to protest, that parents have a right to demand certain things from the school system without being beat up, so to speak. 
I, I think that that's the message that I'd like to leave with you. Encourage parents to come to their school, local schools. I have to tell you that the teachers in the charter schools are not teachers. They are not even called teachers. They are called operators. Oh. And many of them have not had one hour of educational training. Several of them are there because they can get their loans forgiven from being in college. Just pass that word along so that everybody will be on the same page with this. I'm from a union family. My father in Houston, Texas organized a longshoreman union. Um, I'm in my 70s, so that was a long, long time ago. But it's the same situation that we have now. Um, people don't like unions. We were riding with a, a lift operator the other day and we said, my husband said, well, are you all trying to get a union? No, we don't need a union. <laughs> and that's what the young people think. They think that they don't need it and they don't want it, want it. And so then you have people like Mr. Fisher and all the other big guys taking over. So, fight for your local school. Go there. You don't have to be a teacher to go there. Just come and stand on the yard. When an adult is present, you stop a lot of things from happening. So I challenge you to go to your local school, ask your principal what you can do, read a story, help at recess, help at lunchtime. We need to support our community schools. Thank you. All right, we're gonna keep this program moving. The next speaker is someone who has been one of the leaders of the fighting wing of the ILWU. The fighting wing was a part of the historic anti-apartheid struggle. May Day shutting down all 29 ports on the West Coast. The Ned Lloyd Kimberly struggle the Charleston Five, and is one of our leading intellectuals and writers. Brother Jack, Jack Heyman, retired from the waterfront, but not retired from the struggle. Thank you, Clarence. So that, the strike on May Day uh, that Clarence mentioned, 2008, was the first strike in U.S. history against the imperialist wars. And that was against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So what I want to talk about is the struggle that the ILW is facing today, where we have a billionaire, John Fisher, trying to move a stadium from East Oakland, which is where a lot of black and Mexican-American workers live. Uh, and he wants to move it into the port, which, by the way, is illegal. The port property is supposed to be used for industrial and commercial purposes, not for recreational or uh, entertainment. So, the, for some of you who aren't familiar with the LWU, we have a long history of militancy, and that militancy was born out of the 1934 maritime strike in San Francisco that spread up and down the entire West Coast. The leadership of the ILWU went into the black community before the strike began because racism, racism is the greatest obstacle to social revolution in this country. It separates blacks, whites, immigrant workers in a common struggle. But we overcame that by appealing to the black community to say, if you join us on the picket line in this struggle, we will win and we guarantee you jobs on the waterfront. And so when the police killed two strikers in San Francisco, shot them in the back, that immediately, in just a few days, turned into a dual power situation where the entire city was set, shut down into uh, a general strike. And that general strike spread throughout Northern California, 
and the strike itself was an entire West Coast strike. But only here did we have a general strike. And it scared the hell out of the capitalists because if you read the papers, I think Clarence referred to the Chronicle uh, earlier, but the Chronicle, the Examiner, the Call, all the newspapers in the Bay Area said, we've got to be careful, there's a revolution coming. And uh, the Bolsheviks and the bomb throwers and all this. And the working class stood solid because we broke through the racial barrier. And the, the key to that is solidarity. You can't win any struggle, whether it's in Chile, Haiti, Iraq, without solidarity. That's the key. And uh, I just want to say, from 1934 on, we've carried on that militant tradition. We, uh, when the Wisconsin workers, just a few years ago, were occupying the Capitol in Madison, we, on the West Coast here, in, in the, the port of San Francisco and Oakland, we shut down all the ports in the Bay Area, actually in solidarity with those workers. It's that kind of solidarity, class solidarity, that wins. Others have referred to other struggles that we were engaged in. Mumia Abu Jamal, former Black Panther, political prisoner. In 1999, we shut down all the ports on the West Coast to demand freedom for Mumia Abu Jamal. We didn't win his freedom but we got him off a of death row. Now we need to free Mumia. More recently, um, we've, we've taken on other struggles, but in every case, it's always been a question of solidarity. And what's happening now, the reason the trade union movement in this country is being decimated, atrophied, is because of the corrupt, conservative, trade union bureaucracy. So the ILWU is no longer part of the AFL-CIO, the organized trade union movement. But we have always been there for other workers when they were on strike, not just the Wisconsin workers. When the hotel workers were picketing around uh, Fisherman's Wharf area in San Francisco over the last 10, 20 years, we were always on the picket line with them. Our union hall is in San Francisco. We let them use the storage area for banners and posters. That's what solidarity is. And I'm, it, it's just horrible, a shameful situation that the trade union bureaucracy of the hotel and restaurant workers are not in solidarity with us. They're in collaboration with John Fisher to build a new stadium in the port here. This is how the trade union movement is weakened. So, we, we need, to, and it's not just the hotel and restaurant workers union. It's the construction trades too. Historically, they've been very conservative in this country. The same ones that back Donald Trump. They are also supporting Fisher and building a stadium in the port of Oakland. This kind of class collaboration is the opposite of labor solidarity. It's the opposite of what the ILWU has done to support other struggles. And it's got to end today. We need to build a movement in the trade union movement to oust these trade union bureaucrats and build a vibrant, militant trade union movement and stop the Oakland A's from building a stadium in the port of Oakland. Thank you. One of the uh, lies that has been put out by the Oakland A's, Gabe Cabal, who actually, by the way, Gabe Cabal is not only manager of the A's, but he's on the board of directors of the rocket ship charter school chain. Now, so what, if it, what is the rocket ship charter school chain doing? They're trying to bust up public education. They're trying to destroy public education. So he's doing two jobs at once. He's got the A's and rocket ship, but one of the lies that he and John Fisher put out is that the uh, Howard Terminal, where they want to build this stadium, is a dead place. Nothing happens there. Uh, they can use it for a stadium because it's no longer being used. Well, the reality is quite different. And one of the persons that we're going to talk about that today is a Longshore Local 10 member, Rhonda Jackson, who actually has worked in the Howard Terminal, uh, where they train Longshoremen. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.
And I'm so happy to see all you people here standing up. Standing up. It's important that we unite in solidarity on all fronts. Um, defending workers, defending families, defending our community. Look at all the homeless people behind us. I've never seen this before. This is Oakland. Come to Mosswood Park for all type of events. We've never had homelessness like this before. What does this represent? This represents a big change. These billionaires don't care about us. It's all about money. How much more money do you need to live, to survive? Who are you really helping? You're not helping us. As a longshore woman, I represent the ILW Local 10. I'm a proud longshoreman woman. This is a place where there's equality for women. How many places are women equal pay on jobs today? Not many. <laughs> this is a fact. Not only here in California, but all over. This is a fact. As a longshore woman, our training takes place at the Howard Terminal, where they want to build the A Stadium. That's where I got tractor trained. That's where I got trained to lash containers. That's where we have our safety trainings. But yet they say nothing is going on there. That's a lie. It's about big business. It's about money. Not to mention, they say they're going to promise all these jobs. Really? Well, how are you going to be able to afford to live in Oakland if you're selling peanuts and popcorn? We know they're not going to be making that much money. The cost of rent has gone up so much. Look at these people. A lot of these people have jobs. The new homelessness is people living in their cars. This is a reality. This is something that we can't just ignore. My family depends on me. So I'm not just working for myself, paying my bills. My mom is retired. My dad is retired. I'm a grandmother. So if my daughter, my grandkids need something, if my family needs me or my friends, I, I'm the one that everybody turns to. That's right. That's right. So building the A Stadium at Howard Terminal is going to affect not only my job as a longshoreman, but it's going to have a great impact gentrification in West Oakland. We don't want that. They don't care about the residents of West Oakland and the condos that they want to build. Million dollar condos. Can you afford to live there? No. no. I certainly cannot. We got a housing problem. We have an educational problem. This is the time to unite on all fronts. Whether you're a longshoreman, a nurse working at Kaiser, an educator, whatever your field is, this is the time to stand up and stop being passive and just letting things happen. Because what happens to you happens to me. It happens to all of us. And that's, that's some story that you're not going to hear on the mainstream media. Because they're not talking to longshoremen. They're not getting the voices of longshore workers out about the reality. And it's the same all over the world. Working people, you know, people, the media, why don't we get all these explosions? Why is there a rebellion in Chile? Why is there rebellions in Palestine and other countries? What's happening there? You never hear their voices about what, what they're living through, the nightmare that they're living through. And it is a nightmare. It's a nightmare that people are going through around the world. And one of those countries where people are living in a nightmare is the colony of Puerto Rico. And the United States went there in 1889 to bring democracy. Now, you know, that's a, an idea. The United States is going to bring democracy to the people around the world. That's what they propagate. Well, they did that supposed democracy in Puerto Rico, in, in, uh, in, in Philippines, and in other countries which became colonies of the United States. And Cuba broke off that 
dictatorship. They broke off that, that uh, colonization because it was a colony of the United States under Batista. So a brother that we're having next speak, Ricardo Ortiz, is from Puerto Rico, is a labor activist, and has been fighting for the independence of Puerto Rico and for the victory of the working class. Welcome, Ricardo Ortiz. First of all, we have to uh, point out of the elephant in the room, you know, of what happens uh, around the Americas, uh, what happens in here and in Puerto Rico. And uh, I point the finger at capitalism and U.S. imperialism. All right. The country of Chile has an external debt of $180 billion with the, with the United States and the European Union uh, members. We in Puerto Rico have $120 billion in, uh, for in debts with the United States uh, vulture bonds funds. Uh, so that's practically a colonization of a sovereign country. You know, what ha is happening in Chile by the same imperialist powers. In the case of uh, Puerto Rico, exclusively, mostly the United States. In their case, the United States and the European Union. And uh, right here, we see this path of uh, gentrification, so-called urbanization, constructing these crazy uh, multiplex uh, sport complexes. And that, that only hasn't happened here. In Brazil, a country where it has millions of people living below the most miserable levels of poverty, they built these crazy stadiums for the Olympics and stuff, you know, for the World Cup and all these things, while people are dying of hunger in the street. So looking here, we have the same phenomena in a so-called advanced industrialized country. But there are some things that we have to address, as for example. One of the things is that the Democratic Party, an imperialist uh, capitalist party, has practically sucked up the labor movement, unfortunately. And we have to break those chains. We have to get out of the uh, supporting the Democratic Party. Right. Somebody that spoke before me said something about the progressive Democrats, etc. It's not just thing. Actually, Obama was the criminal that signed PROMESA, the law that put Puerto Rico in control of a so-called fiscal control board that is sucking up the money from Puerto Rico and pulling food, pushing for a privatization for these uh, vulture funds, corporations, and banks. And that's the Democratic Party for you. And, and bombed Africa more than any European president. That's right. And also, <laughs> you know, solidarity with Haiti. Clinton, you know, put troops in Haiti. Or the, the Democratic Party presidency. It was Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat criminal, in 1915 that invaded the Republic of Haiti and established an occupation that lasted more than two decades. So, and Lyndon P. Johnson invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965, got <coughs> the, and led the American effort in Vietnam. So start talking and start believing the so-called Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a graveyard of social struggles. We have to build an independent workers' party. Right. One party that will confiscate all this capitalist property that has been stolen right. from the workers. Revolution. That's what we got to do. A, a, a party that will confiscate land and give it to the people that toilet, <coughs> that work on it, that build their richness. The real people that uh, make wealth are the people that produce work, working, as we all in here do or have done. But in order to do that, we got to call also this by its own name. We got to remember and we got to make present that it's not a matter of who is the lesser of the evils. We have seen that repeatedly. Every time some reformist demagogue and liberal comes to power, he does it even worse than his predecessors. So forget about reformism. 
We gotta begin by building a new workers international. We gotta support each other. We gotta do sit downs. We gotta do strikes. But we gotta march like crazy until we bring this crazy criminal capitalist system down. All right. Yeah. Thank you. We can't leave this rally without talking about the struggle of our brothers and sisters in Mexico. Because, you know, it's, it's strange in this country. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the Mexican people, the Latino people, the indigenous people were here in California before it was California. They have as much right to this land as the people here presently have. That's where they come from. Yet the people of Mexico are being blamed by this racist president, Trump for the cause of this economic crisis. They're saying that they're criminals and they're rapists. The, the fact is, we need a united movement of workers in California, workers in the United States with workers in Mexico. They face the same capitals, the same billionaires that people in this country face. We need unity with them against these people. We need solidarity with them. And our speaker next is Al Rojas. Al Rojas was a founder, co-founder of the United Farm Workers. He was an indigenous farm worker in Central Valley. He took up a struggle to organize the farm workers. And he is today fighting for the 70,000 workers in San Quintin uh, on the border, where there's 70,000 farm workers and families living on $7 a day on slave labor wages right next to California. That's what's going on. They, get, they come here to work, they get kicked out, and then they're put in slave labor in, in, in uh, Baja. So welcome, Al Rojas. Brothers and sisters, a lot of what's been said here is right on. We all eat every day three meals. On this day and even Sundays, the farm workers who feed people in this country products that come from Mexico under U.S. corporation domination, which is capitalism. That's who the evil empire is. I don't know how many of you know about the Driscoll boycott and also the Andrew and Williamson boycott, which sells its berries to Costco. I'm a strong believer of what has been said here. We need to take the offensive. All these damn movements are an attack against unions, working people in this country, and privatization. That's what it's about. The bottom line is we're letting them get away with it. And who is doing that? We for not moving and organizing and bringing on the young people in the universities and the high schools and where they're going to work and wherever they're going to work. We're all workers. We were at one time. People ask me, where did all these Mexican immigrants come from? <laughs> I said, first of all, let me clarify one damn thing. You ignorant this will be. Get this through your head. We're indigenous people. This land belongs to the Americas. It's indigenous people. From the North American continent all the way down to way down below Chile and the South American countries. You ask me, where did all these people come from? <coughs> You've never heard of the North American Free Trade Agreement? What the hell they did to the, not only the Mexican people, but the people in the world? It's capitalism. It's money. <coughs> it's privatization. Every issue. Education, work, everything that has to do with property, railroads, shipyards, <coughs> it's all been privatized. Why? The same problem that we're having with the Longshoremen's Union. The same problem that we see here with all these people who cannot afford to have a decent home. The sister that was here. Excuse me. Was very clear. She's endangered 
by what's happening and what's been happening with the Longshoremen's Union called engineering automation. What does that mean? The same thing Henry Ford told the brother from the Auto Workers Union, the president, after he took him to a tour, to the Ford plant, and he said, what did you think about uh, the plant? All these arms and steel arms assembling a car. The most marvelous, most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. But, he said, but, you got a problem. The day you automate all those plants, Who's going to buy your fucking cars? Thank you. Excuse my language. But today, we are in trouble in the union movement. There is no union movement. There's a movement about the Democratic Party. This whole thing about progressive, to me that's a lot of BS. Until we, Build our own party, like our brother from Puerto Rico said. That's independent. That is under the control of its leadership from the rank and file. Today, that is not the case. We have union leaders and several unions who are basically employees and staffers that do not represent the rank and file. We built a power workers union, we thought, and I'm very critical. I love that union. People died, were thrown in prison, they were beaten up. What do we have today? We have the Driscoll boycott. And they will not tell the truth to people and romanticize about the image of Cesar Chavez. Where was it Cesar Chavez? It was the people in the fields that moved that movement to be what it is and was to be the way it should be. You have people who are earning. And he said it to us when we won the boycott in 1970. Not one staffer will earn more than a worker who's working in the fields under a union contract. Today, Remind you, for 15 years, many of us invested our lives to $15, $10 a week in building the movement. And I said to Chavez, the day we don't have this union being taken over by the workers at the rank and file, you and I are organizers. We go on to somewhere else. Let them take the union, let them defend their union. He got pissed with me. He says, I don't give a damn, but that's not going to happen. It did happen. Today, that union is no different from any other union. You call it what you want. You ask the people who are leaders. Where did you come from? Me? Michigan State University. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that, but what the hell are you doing leading a farm workers union when you've never come from the fields. So going on, that individual selected the president for the workers as the leader and the president and never worked with in the fields picking grapes. I'm just gonna cut it right here. I'm gonna ask you all to understand one thing. It's true. What's happening to the Longshoremen's Union here in the port is about the same thing but our governor did when he was mayor of San Francisco. Some of you are familiar with the projects over here on, in Hunters Point. Some of you are familiar with the nuclear waste that was lodged in a warehouse there. They didn't give a damn about people of color, our black brothers and sisters that are living there in poor public housing, that they were being contaminated. Go look for that public housing. 
where are they and where are they and many of our brothers and sisters from Latin America and Mexico in the mission. They've been forced over across the bridge here. But before that, I understand that they housed them, uh, many of our black brothers and sisters, at the Treasure Island. Now, they're kicking them out again. Because now they want to use that island to build condominiums. The same damn thing that's happening with the Longshoremen's Union here. Longshoremen's Union has the issue about automation. And they've been cut back, right, brother? And they're not finished. How many of you, I'm going to finish, <laughs> how many of you understand that there's the trade agreement in Congress right now? It hasn't been approved. In Mexico, they approved it. But they approved it with outsourcing. Some of you know what outsourcing is? The coming game of how they declassify you. Same things happening and happened to the longshoremen and other unions. Well, that trade agreement, we need to put a stop to it. Supposedly, they had labor laws, protection, and democratization for workers. It's not happening. The main problem we have is this party, the Democratic Party, who comes in and takes over with these unions, and they're doing right now getting ready for the election. Try to get rid of that evil bastard that's in, in, in Washington. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? Well, unless we build an international labor movement, I hate to see what's going to happen to this country and my great-great-grandkids of what's going to be left. We have to fight back. We have to get young people involved, a lot more people in here, to have them begin to organize people. I want to thank everybody here for allowing me to speak here. Thank you very much. The question of public property, public space, and protecting public space for the people is critical in Chile, in Puerto Rico, all over the world. So we have to unite all these struggles to defend our parks, to defend our schools, to defend our public spaces. So our, our next speaker is Rosa. Rosa is, uh, is actually the, uh, the maker of this sign here on Jobs, Housing for All, Not Another Stadium. Welcome, Rosa, from the Answer Coalition. Money for jobs and education, not for war and occupation. Money for jobs and education. Not for war and occupation. Money for jobs and education. Not for war and occupation. Money for jobs and education. Not for war and occupation. Woo! 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 My name is Rosa and I'm a member of the Answer Coalition. We are here today because we must defend our communities from the capitalist interests driving the Oakland A's new stadium proposal. They plan to build a 34,000 seat stadium and 4,000 luxury housing units on top of the Port of Oakland, the fifth largest port in the U.S. and an important source of living wage jobs in Northern California. Capitalists and their city government representatives want to replace union jobs at the port with expensive condominiums, sorry, we cannot afford. Houselessness in Oakland has increased by 47% since 2017, with black Oakland residents most impacted. While there are more empty residencies in Oakland than there are people without housing, Oakland Mayor Libby Schaap insists that the primary cause of houselessness in the city is a shortage of housing. In reality, Shaft's job as mayor is not to house the unhoused, but to oil the machine that necessarily creates houselessness in the first place. The capitalist system that produces and distributes housing to maximize profit instead of to fulfill human needs. Our city governments are instruments for the exploitation of the oppressed class, maximizing profits for billionaires at the expense of the rest of us. Developers profit from a housing market that decimates community through high rents and property rights backed by police terror. Working class neighborhoods, like West Oakland, are already targeted by divestment and predatory lending that result in evictions and foreclosures. 
If the proposed expensive condominiums are built at the Port of Oakland, the price of everything around them will increase. At higher rates, West Oakland residents will be forced out of their homes to make way for wealthier people who can afford to pay more for housing. It's clear that billionaire John J. Fisher, child of the founders of the nation's largest clothing retailer, San Francisco-based Gap Inc., and the owner of the Oakland A's, intends to capitalize on and accelerate gentrification in Oakland. About 72,000 jobs are generated from the economy that the Port of Oakland creates, and the ILWU guarantees its members a retirement plan as well as earnings well above minimum wage. While the Oakland A's pays executives and some baseball players millions, the majority of Oakland A's workers get low wage, part-time jobs without benefits, vacation, or retirement. In no state can a worker making minimum wage afford a two-bedroom unit at market weight while working a 40-hour week. In California, 88 hours of minimum wage work per week are needed to afford market rate rent. The answer to our question is our organized resistance and our militant solidarity. We must defend our jobs and communities from continued attack by rejecting the Oakland A's new stadium and condominium proposal. Jobs and housing for all, not another stadium. Thank you. And one of the other critical struggles going on in the world today is the fight to defend the Palestinian people, the apartheid regime, and fight, fighting the apartheid regime of Israel. And, you know, it's interesting that the United States spends more money uh, for supporting Israel and supporting the milita military in Israel to repress the Palestinians uh, than they do supporting people in this country. That, that's what's happening. They have money for the military in Israel. The Democrats and Republicans both have more money for Israel. Yet people in this country right here don't have homes to live. They don't have health care. So our next speaker, Mohammed, is going to talk about the struggle to defend the Palestinian people and unity. Before I introduce him, the ILWU supported a community labor boycott of the Zim ship line. So they put their, strong, their solidarity in action by refusing to load the Zim ships, as it was pointed out earlier. Welcome, Mohammed. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here to say some words in solidarity. Um, my name is Mohammed. I am here as a Palestinian um, with the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. And as Palestinians and as Arabs, we stand in deep solidarity with all those who are fighting against the assault on workers everywhere. So as we're seeing today, whether it be at the Port of Oakland, whether it be at our city schools, there is an attempt to strip away Oakland's, the community's values of social and economic self-determination. We're seeing that everywhere. Yet, we know very well that with oppression and repression comes resistance. And we're seeing that in communities here in Oakland, we're seeing that with the ongoing legacy of the ILWU, Local 10's leadership in particular, we see it with the teacher strike, with communities organizing against the violence of policing and imprisonment, we see it with hunger strikers every day going on strike in Palestine, with a new march of return happening every day. And I'm glad that the block the boat actions were mentioned because it is a perfect demonstration that we can't win without solidarity. When Israel was bombarding the people of Gaza, we took to the ports and built with workers. It was a struggle that could not have happened without solidarity. And five years since we blocked the apartheid Israeli zimshit from docking and unloading at the Port of Oakland, it has not returned, right? It has not returned. So I really, I wanna keep this brief. And right now we are seeing massive resistance in Chile as a result of decades of neoliberal policy, right? The neoliberal experiment started in Chile and now we're seeing resistance on a massive level being waged by the people that are not taking it anymore. So 
Let's draw on the inspiration from our brothers, our sisters, our comrades in Chile. Let's send solidarity to that struggle. Let's send solidarity across all borders to Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, the Philippines, Palestine, to the ports and the workers that work the ports, not just in Oakland, but across the world, and the people of Oakland that are resisting. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of the teachers who has been struggling with the ILWU and the teachers against privatization and also against the, uh, the privatization of the port. Welcome Shane, who's a member of the Oakland Education Association. I just want to give you guys some context of what we've been facing in Oakland. Um, since about 2003, the private sector has been ag aggressively trying to reshape Oakland into a majority charter district. They've, they've managed to get about 40 schools. Uh, so right now we're looking at the district, OUSD, we still have about 80 public schools, but there's um, about almost 40 charter schools as well. So we went on strike last year uh, to address, you know, the, the almost the criminal uh, tentative agreement or the criminal offer that the, uh, the district was offering us was, was a 1.5% one-time bonus. Uh, and then uh, nothing to address the, the ridiculous class sizes, the fact that there's almost no nurses in the district, counselors, speech pathologists, all that stuff that uh, kids desperately need, especially in Oakland. Um, so we signed our agreement, uh, but the pr problem is, is that the district is aggressively trying to close public, public schools. So the next five years, they're trying to close 24 public schools, close or merge 24 public schools. This is going to open up Oakland Unified School District to become a majority charter district. And the charter schools, of which the Fisher family, the ones who are trying to privatize uh, Howard Terminal for the Oakland A's, are probably the most well-known um, charter or operators in the country. They have over 100 schools. Their, their program is called KIPP, Knowledge is Power Program, K-I-P-P. All right, so there's the links that you know, we want to talk about and why, how, how we need to fight this as a unified working class struggle and not just one local here fighting, the ILWU Local 10 fighting here. We have to bring it all together to make sure that our terminal stays within the ILWU framework. And we want to make sure we stop these 24 public schools from being closed or merged over the next five years. Steve spoke about the Kaiser uh, elementary School. Kaiser Elementary School is one of the most high-performing elementary schools in Oakland Unified School District. However, the Oakland Unified School District is not that interested in public education. All right? We have a school board that is entirely bought off by private sector interests. The last uh, contested school board seat, uh, the union, our union ran a candidate and the school board got uh, somebody named Gary Yee, who was, was in retirement, he'd been a long time, you know, friend of the charter schools, to come back and run again. Anyway, Michael Bloomberg, may, former mayor of New York City, late in that race, dumped $150,000 to his campaign. So that's a perfect example of what we face in Oakland, is that we face a bought-off school board that is aggressively trying to shift public education in Oakland to the private sector. Okay, so these Kaiser Elementary School parents have, have kind of taken on the struggle to keep their school open. Uh, we want to encourage everybody to come out and support them and all the other parents, teachers, and students to prevent this kind of action to continue in Oakland. They call it the blueprint for public education. All right, all it is is a, a, a basically a giveaway. We also the district was forced to take a state loan. It, it was a, a, a legislation called AB 1840, written by Rob Bonta, one of our friends in the Democratic Party. All right? So they made this bill. It's kind of like the structural readjustment that happens in developing nations. So you take this loan, but in order for you to take the loan, you first have to make all these draconian budget cuts. So the district closed, cut programs from foster youth, restorative justice. Uh, they cut, you know, from their human resources. Mind you, this was the summer when they should be doing all the hiring. So there's all these vacancies that open right now. Um, anyway, uh, so this is kind of what I just wanted to give you some perspective of 
the assaults on public education, particularly in Oakland, because this is kind of, as far as California is concerned, LA and Oakland are really ground zero for the private sector to you know, shift public education from democratic control into uh, private sector control, which is what the Fisher Foundation has been doing for years and years and years. New York City, Detroit, obviously uh, many of you I'm sure have heard about New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, they took the opportunity to shut the entire public schools down in New Orleans. There are no more public schools in New Orleans. Uh, so please, please, anytime you hear about anything that is going on with public education in Oakland, make sure you, you know, pay attention, come out. Uh, we, we need all the help we can get. Like, like Steve said, these folks were just trying to prevent them to close a high-functioning elementary school, and the police brought up batons, and they put up barricades in front of the school board. Six people got arrested. One woman ended up, like, you know, tearing her MCL and ACL. I mean, this is just, you know, these are parents trying to prevent their, their public school from being closed. So I really appreciate all of you for coming out. Obviously, we want to make sure we expand our struggle to include SEIU, AFSCME, UPT. All these other unions have to come into the fray or else we're going to still be fighting this really piecemeal strategy, which we've been doing for years. And unfortunately, because we also face uh, uh, what we are, the Democratic Party, which is allegedly for workers, but we all know the truth behind that. So I think in that, that, that realm of struggle, if we all could come, you know, and, and start fighting, you know, each, as we, you know, we, we, we made uh, the original overtures around May Day last year where we tried to organize, uh, and we did organize a nice little May Day march with the ILWU in the interest of, you know, preserving Howard Terminal as well as keeping these 24 public schools public. Uh, but that's all I have to, you know, say. Yeah, I hope, you know, like we, we can, uh, again, make some more more unified struggle as, you know, obviously the, the ILWU's uh, tagline, injury one that is an injury to all, uh, is really in play in 2020. Thank you, Shane. So this is going to be the first of others. We have a sign-up list if you want to get more information, because we need more united fronts uh, of all working people, of all unions, of all peoples around the world. That is the power to bring the working people together and to defeat these uh, really criminals. It's a criminal system and they're criminals and gangsters who are running this system that should be arrested and put in prison. I mean, they, that's where they belong. They belong in prison. But that is only going to happen by everyone uniting together and mobilizing. So our uh, next speaker is going to introduce uh, another speaker, Lisa uh, Milos, who is one of the coordinators of this rally today. She's a worker at uh, rank and file worker at UCSF in Upti. CWA Upti, and she's been taking up the fight to defend the Chilean people. Her mother was Chilean, and she's Chilean American. Welcome, Lisa Milos. I, um, I'm going to have the honor of uh, presenting uh, David Welsh um, very soon, uh, from the representative of uh, the delegate of the San Francisco Labor Council from the Letter Carriers Union and longtime activist. Uh, but I just want to say a couple of words. Um, I'm a member of Upti and um, uni the University of Professional and Technical Workers um, and part of uh, Communication Workers of America. And I want to say that as a delegate last March uh, to UPTI convention, March 31st in Chile, there was major mobilizing. About a million people went out in the streets in Chile on March 31st, which was uh, organizing uh, No Mas AFP. What is IFP? IFP were the privatized pension system that the Chilean people have been subjected to during the last 40 years. The same pension system that they're trying to impose upon the workers that you see. And we at that time did not have a contract for two and a half years and we had to go through four strikes in order to be able to win a contract. We still haven't won the pension issue because one more year we're going to have to re probably there's an opener in our contract, which means we're going to have to probably fight for our contract again. But what is a privatized pension system? What, is, what, is, what are the people in Chile struggling for? After 40 years of this private system that's called a defined contribution, a defined contribution means you are forced by the government to give up a certain percentage of your money and you put it in a pool, right? You put it in a pool and you sort of expect something to get back to you, right? Okay, with more than 50% of the Chilean people earning minimum wage, which in Chile is about uh, 400,000 pesos, which 
I think rounds about to about five hundred uh, and fifty or six hundred dollars a month or something like that. Now, guess what? How much pensioners earn? Pensioners earn between a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand pesos a month, which is like less than half of minimum wage. So right now, one of the demands that is going on in Chile is to bring the pensions up to at least minimum wage, right? The poor people in Chile, the pensioners are literally, they cannot pay for their medication. So, but who are we fighting against? Let's look at this for a second. We are put workers all over the world, the ones who have pension systems or these private retirement fund systems, which are called 401ks, we are putting our money into Blackstone Group. We're putting our money into Johnson's. We're putting our money into John Fisher's. The gap. We're putting our money into those corporations that, at the same time, they're funding our opposition. The Blackstone Group, they put, poured $60 million of the ca against the campaign to have rent control in California during this last election. $60 million. So we're funding our own destruction. So what we need to do is we need to support a public banking system where we put our money into a public system where we can support the growth of our children, the growth of our own communities, and the growth of clean energy for, for a clean future. I agree, we, we need definitely, this can't happen without workers being at the forefront. Workers party, the unions being at the forefront of this. I'm a rank and file member, I'm not speaking on behalf of my union, but our convention last May, March 31st vote, voted in favor of a resolution to support the NOMAS IFP workers and to fight for our pension. And I want to say that the Chile situation brings to the forefront, brings to the forefront what it happens to a country that becomes privatized, where even the damn water is privatized. There's been such a level of corruption, such a level of corruption that is abominable. The pharmaceutical companies were caught price fixing. These corporations did not get any kind of uh, sentence. They were caught not paying their taxes in the trillions. The, the, the students of Chile are in the same problems as the students here, up to our necks in debt, trillion dollar debts. It's the same struggle. It's the same fight. And I'm really honored to be able to invite David Welch, San Francisco delegate of the uh, delegate of the San Francisco Labor Council, who's going to give an announcement about a resolution that was passed on Monday, October 28th, in support of the people of Chile. Here he is. On September 11th, 1973, the United States organized a coup d'etat in Chile to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende, which was a, a worker-friendly government, and replaced him with a capitalist-friendly government of Pinochet, a, a government that routinely used brutal force against the people's movements of that country. Now, here we have Last Friday, a million people demonstrated in the country of Chile. A million people, supported by two major labor federations, the port workers, and many other organizations. You know, what, what kicked off this whole thing was the youth. Because they couldn't afford, because the, the government this neoliberal government of Piñera, supported by the United States, of course, supported by not just Trump, but the Democrats. The youth could not afford a, a hike in the subway fares or any other public transit fares. So they, they responded by jumping the turnstile. 
And well, that's, so that's a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, dramatic thing to do, to jump the turnstiles in, in their masses. And people realizing that the minimum wage is uh, one, uh, uh, what's the minimum wage, Lisa? 100,000 pesos? Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. What is it? Three hundred thousand pesos, it's like five hundred and twenty or five hundred and thirty. About five hundred twenty or five hundred and thirty dollars a month. And so people were hurting all over Chile with this neoliberal government that had been sponsored and initiated basically by the right wing in the United States, by the capitalists of the United States. So they started demonstrating and then Last Friday, they, a million demonstrated, and they've been demonstrating since. Uh, so I, I don't want to talk for a long time, except just to say that the Labor Council unanimously passed a resolution in support of the rising Chilean people's movement for economic equality and political freedom. And. Uh, they, they said, whereas the Piñera government response to these demonstrations was to send in the Carabineros, who are the Chilean police force, which savagely attacks the youth and even threw tear gas into the trains, trapping passengers in the toxic fumes, etc. The pension system in Chile, that's a big issue. If you retire after working your whole life in some job, and you have nothing to live on for your family. This is a big issue. The pension system was privatized under the Pinochet dis dictatorship, which the United States, remember, installed back in 1973. In any case, and then they imposed upon the entire working class of Chile by means of a bloody dictatorship, outlawing strikes, imprisoning activists, and disappearing thousands of workers and privatized health care, education, and even water. You remember, you remember the story about Victor Hara, who was a, a musician, whose songs ignited the, his songs of freedom ignited the freedom movement in Chile that brought about the, the government of, uh, of Brother Allende. They, they took Victor Hara into a stadium and ripped the guitar from his hands and cut off his hands. That's the kind of brutal dictatorship that the United States has been sponsoring, not just in Chile, but other countries in Latin America, and they're trying to bring it back. So, uh, I, I'm not gonna read this whole resolution, but it talks about the police and armed forces of Chile Fil being filmed setting fire to supermarkets, metro stations, and, and doing all these terroristic activities. These are the police forces are doing all these terrorist activities which harm the people. In any case, uh, it talks about a lot of good things like solidarity, and then resolves to support the Chilean people's movement for economic equality and political freedom and call on the Piñera government to send the troops back to the barracks and stop oppressing the people. So I think this is a good step that the San Francisco Labor Council passed this resolution unanimously and uh, with the support of the executive director uh, of, of the of the council, Rudy, brother Rudy, and, and so it was a it was a situation where all the different parts of the labor council, all the different factions, the ones that are sometimes conservative, are sometimes liberal, they came together to support this resolution. This is a very good step, and uh, I'm not going to go on and on because it's a long time here. We've been out here demonstrating our determination and solidarity, and it's very impressive. Thank you very much.
palomo, palomo.